So I think some folks were interested in hearing more about the models. So um, to, you had mentioned you did a little shout out to Pete. So you definitely touched on some models. Could you talk a little bit more in depth about what those models are um, and, and how you're using them? Sure. So we're, so we're using um, a PNBD version for to get all of this information. Actually tried some of the other ones, like the BGBB model and the BGNBD and all of like the different varieties of those acronyms. Um, but with the PNBD model, we found that we had the best results. And so after we ran our training and we did like a training set, a test set, that worked out. Then we actually took those model, took those results to some of, to our fundraising team that was actually intimately familiar with a lot of those profiles. And we were like, you know, this is the output of one model. It says 60% of return. Like you've talked to this person, does that sound about right? And they're like, yeah, actually that's, that's like great. And so for us, that was a really good indicator that the results were reliable. We did a few more of these spot checks. And so um, that's how we ultimately decided which model was, was worthwhile. Um, and is, are there, is, somebody's asked a question also about what kind of academic papers you've studied. So again, but are there any that you would recommend? You've thrown out four different kind of um, potential models that people could look at between beta gamma and beta binomial. But, but what are the different papers that you would say, oh, if you want to know what that really means, <laughs> if, you're, if you're not already in that world and you want to know what that means a little bit more, do you have recommendations for people? Sure. I mean, honestly, I think you're fine just Googling, like, Fader and Hardy 2010, and you'll get like the first 10 links. All of those PDFs are really good. Um, there's also like some slides around each of those that help. They like break down a lot of the stat language into actual into like regular words. So I found that to be really helpful. Um, but yeah, all of this is like readily available online, and I I didn't really have to search very hard to find it. Great, and so. Um, the audience is also interested to know if you have any way currently, and then if so, what is it, of identifying when you should stop soliciting donors. Um, is there kind of a threshold point? How do you know? What are the metrics that might kind of unveil that? Um, are you doing anything in that space at all? I mean, that's a good question because um, just as we have a bifurcated audience in a way of sort of managing what we consider low touch donors and high touch donors, we mm -hmm. also have a bifurcated communication stream. So we actually, on the marketing side, don't solicit donors who are considered major donors. Um, and we're actually seeking to change that. So this year we're gonna be doing testing around how can we do some scaled automated marketing to major donors that's not considered solicitous in a way that has been in the past. Okay. Um, but in terms of the marketing side of things, um, it's a tough question to answer just because most of that activity happens in Q4 of each year. It's kind of like the heaviest time that we're hitting. Um, we did do some testing last year where we you know, could see if somebody had opened an, an, an email and then donated that we then took them out of the, the, the scheme of things. But do you have anything else to say about that? No, I think that's, I think that's pretty spot on. We, it's not like we have some, some formula or algorithm around like when do you know when to stop. Um, I think that we just look at really like the give, a person's giving behavior. If they haven't donated in like 10 years, we probably aren't going to keep asking. Um, some of that also just comes from conversations that some of our relationship managers have with folks if they get the sense that you know, maybe it's time to take a step back. So some of this is just done intuitively and qualitatively, and it would, would be really exciting to get to a place where we, where we quantify that a little bit more. I have to say, Colleen, like on the high end of things, it's actually the opposite problem, which is that our lean de development department doesn't have enough time to reach out to hundreds of people in their portfolio. Sure. So this is where it's helpful for them to say, I should, I should spend my time with, with these, this group of people. Mm -hmm. Perfect. OK, so and Emily, you had alluded to um, the concept of the, you know, your, your, the population of donors that you kind of have out there. So the audience is curious why you have identified, like how you came to find such a, sm what they're thinking is a small number um, of folks out there. Yeah, it's, well, it's, it's simply just a rare disease. So the estimate is that one to two million people in the US alone have PD. And then we have simply created a halo around these people such that we assume three to four friends and family members around them equal four to five million target population. Um, so over the past 18 months, we've been 
exponentially increasing our digital footprint to capture more of those people. Um, our CRM has what we think is roughly you know, 15 to 20% of that number, but we're not really satisfied with that. So um, we're working on substantially improving that, that penetration rate. Okay, and, and as a follow-up on that, the, the audience was asking, so do you think that there is um, an opportunity to target a broader audience? How would you target a broader audience and I guess kind of appeal to them if they don't, if they aren't part of this three to four person halo around a person affected, have you considered ways to approach that broader audience? Yeah, that's a really good question because we've been grappling with that on the brand management side of things. Um, one way we thought would to approach it would be to kind of look at, you know, sort of position ourselves within the realm of all sort of brain or neurological diseases, you know, one of which is Alzheimer's, mm -hmm. which, you know, we can draw some comparisons to and sort of position ourselves in that, in that world um, and seek help that way. I think it would require some co-marketing and a little more thinking. It's not something we've traditionally done. Um, so we, we would need to think that through. I mean, there's a lot of logic to say that we should really just be doing a lot of look-alike modeling on the people we know sure. look like like our target audience, and sure. that's, that's what we've been doing so far. Fair enough. Okay, so how do you use data to identify you know, small dollar donors um, that could become larger dollar donors? How, how do you know when you, know, you have this small donation, somebody donates $100, that there actually possibly could be something more than that? How do you figure that out? Yeah, we are in, in the midst of doing a lead qualification project, which that is the objective of okay. said project. Um, but we, there are certain characteristics that we see on the major donor end, such as just having a charitable mindset or any sort of other in high, high end involvement with other foundations, which traditionally have been a good trigger in kind of spotting these potential or these like really good prospects. So we're, as I said, in the process of trying to like take some of that of those characteristics and quantify them, scale them in such a way that when someone does make like a five dollar donation for the first time, that we can be a bit savvier about you know knowing their full potential. I think we're also looking at third party data overlays, so just wealth engine data that we can sure. append is something we we want to do. Okay. Future down the road. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. And um, some folks want to know what business intelligence platforms you're using. They're curious about what you what you put into place. Um, so, not to be like a customer plug or anything. <laughs> um, so we're using a. You're a fan. A, Come on. Yeah. Um, so we're using a, a platform called Domo, and we have a strategic partnership with um, with one of their advanced analytics vendors as well, so that we can truly provide a a lot of this information and data to everyone at the foundation, not necessarily folks that have a technical or statistics background. So to what Emily was mentioning before, we're, we are working with other um, analysts that are sitting in different departments to make sure that they do feel comfortable with the information that's being pulled in, that they also understand what's going on, and that they can then um, sort of liaise back to their teams. And so we just kind of are trying to grow this outward. Excellent. So the uh, question has bubbled up to the surface that's really not necessarily analytics oriented, more marketing oriented question, but um, since it's got the highest number of votes, we'll go for <laughs> it here. So how did the success and viral nature of the ALS Ice Bucket Challenge impact your marketing efforts? Did it change anything for you? Did you was there any impact for you folks when that occurred? I wasn't at the foundation when that occurred, and um, but it was probably an impetus for looking for a person to fill a role like mine. Um, I think virility is really interesting, and and we know that it, that um, effort was actually started organically and not not necessarily by the organization. But um, I I I feel like we did learn some lessons for it, and last year we prepared for. Um, and in, you know, um, events around Back to the Future Day, which was October 21st. It was the day in Back to the Future 2 that Marty McFly travels to, um, into the future. And we knew that that was coming up. Um, we knew that we had the, the opportunity for virility. And um, we knew, um, due to a past partnership with, with Nike, that they were going to be um, launching their line of self-lacing mags. So 
we prepared for what we thought would be virility and, and, and we got it. We, we co-marketed with Nike and we were able to um, release the first photos and videos of Michael trying on the self-lacing Nike mags that were personally delivered to him um, by the CEO of Nike, Mark, Pike, Mark Parker. So um, I can't say we, st we started it, but, but we, we prepared for what we thought would be um, a social moment and it was. Awesome. All right, and I think we'll do one more question here. So um, folks are curious about how you're identifying, you know, acquiring customers in any um, industry can be a very expensive process. I imagine that acquiring new donors can be a similarly expensive process. Um, how, how do you guys go about that? How, are you, how do you target new populations? We've focused um, a ton of time on social, on Facebook in particular. Uh, we've grown our social base, I think, 30% over 18 months. Um, we see a lot of donations coming through Facebook. We also see um, clinical trial recruitment coming through, through Facebook. We see a lot of success with um, paid um, AdWords mm -hmm. um, now. Um, but our, our traffic funnel is, is social um, and email. And um, so, but, but, but we're pretty focused on, on social um, and and that's really where, where we are. Yeah, especially since our, our Facebook page, at least, has really turned into just sort of like a, a chat room almost, where there's so much discussion from the community. And so it's really just curating an environment where you can bring people together to discuss a lot of very personal issues that they have. And so even just like nurturing that community through social, I think, has been a really amazing way to reach an enormous amount of people. Great. Well, thank you both so much for coming. Let's give thank them a you. Hand.